This year, we are chairing the Asian Partner Group of the OSCE. The OSCE Asian Conference takes place in Seoul, back to back to Shangri-La on Monday. So the security dialogue between Asia and Europe can and should be strengthened. This is why, as a Swiss foreign minister, I participate in this discussion about Asia-Pacific region. And my main argument, ladies and gentlemen, is that cooperative security can be part of the answer, can help ensure that the Asia-Pacific remains a global economic powerhouse and does not turn into a zone of instability. My take is not that the OSCE can be a model to Asia. My take is that some instruments of cooperative security can make a real difference in your Asian life and context too. These instruments do not stand in the way of bilateral security ties or alliances. Rather, cooperative security should be regarded as an extra layer of security. In one sentence, it is a sort of reassurance. I'd like to give you some insight from this OSC experience, and I have only five points. First, cooperative security requires dialogue. Prime Minister Lee said yesterday, you have to be prepared to talk, and you can only build bridges and find solutions with dialogue. Dialogue that is inclusive, that takes place at all levels, especially at the highest political levels, dialogue between all relevant agencies, also between the militaries, dialogues on platforms that provide for structured exchange of views. My second point, cooperative security requires transparency to reduce mutual distrust. The USC was the first organization to develop so-called confidence-building measures, military and also non-military confidence-building measures. For example, here in your region, why not naval transparency measures such as ship visits, notification activities, information about planning and procurement, and so, and so on, and so on. This brings me to my third point. Cooperative security is a vehicle to create trust. It doesn't depend of, on the existence of trust, but it can create afterwards trust. Above all, it is tied to a comprehensive security approach. It is about fostering trust by working together on a broad number of common challenges like terrorism, cyber threats, or disaster risk reduction. So not only point where we agree to disagree, but also point where we can agree to agree. Applied to Asia-Pacific, sovereignty disputes should not stand in the way of cooperative efforts to deal with other security-related challenges. Another lesson I specifically take from the Ukraine crisis is that economic dividing lines can have negative security implication. Strengthening economic connectivity and fostering trade bridges rather than trade barriers should be a key pillar of comprehensive security. My first point, Mr. President, Cooperative security can be bolstered by jointly working out common principles, even if progress in establishing code of conduct for the South China Sea may have been slow in the past. This could be a potential avenue to diffuse tension in the region. And finally, my fifth point, cooperative security gets more effective if mechanisms for crisis prevention and for crisis response can be put in place. More easily said, than done, I know. In the case of the OSC, it needed the fall of the Berlin Wall when there was a sense of common purpose to really do that. Still, the early harvest measures that ASEAN and China announced last year demonstrate that incremental steps are possible. Measures such as hotlines among search and rescue agencies or among foreign ministries on maritime emergencies can promote trust and can enhance security. I'm sure that you all think, ladies and gentlemen, that Switzerland is not exactly what you would call a maritime power and a maritime expert. This is true, despite the fact that we have marvelous lakes and despite the fact that the Swiss Alinghi sailing boat won the America's Cup twice. But while we are not a maritime power, we are a mediation power. We are impartial. We facilitate dialogue. We build bridges in many conflicts. And we have Geneva. Europe's hub for peace, where numerous international talks to try to prevent or resolve conflicts have taken place. 
and we have also, and we are also an innovation and economic power, so we have a direct strong interest in regional stability and safe shipping routes in the Asia-Pacific. Asia security challenges are for Asian to resolve. Thank you for having listened to us Swiss people, but we stand Switzerland ready to facilitate whenever it should be requested. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, thank you very much. I think the five principles you enunciated will form a very interesting basis for further discussion this okay. afternoon. Uh, Excellency, Mr. Antonov, over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have prepared a very long, long statement. I hope, hope that the Chairman will not be against if I decide to distribute it later after our uh, uh, conversation. At least I tried to put uh, all uh, uh, Russian ideas in one paper. It was very difficult, <laughs> it goes without saying. But I'll try to do my best. So you see that I have just only five minutes. I'll try uh, to, uh, to draw your attention to very, very important uh, uh, remarks and uh, points uh, that I would like uh, to convey today. There are just only Six. First, uh, and if you permit me, I will look at my uh, text. Uh, that um, much has been uh, uh, much has been said on the resurgence and global significance of Asia Pacific region. There is hardly any doubt that the future belongs to it, to our country. Being an integral part of the Asia Pacific, peace and prosperity in this region is a matter of paramount importance. Based on this premise, we are building our work with all countries concerned. Against the backdrop of rapid economic growth in the region and its growing impact on the world affairs, there is still much to be done in order to create a regional architecture of equal and indivisible security that would guarantee peace and security of all nations regardless of their size and military capabilities. We consider this an important mission in view of a wide range of long-standing unresolved issues on the security agenda, as well as new challenges and threats. All of them together, and some of them individually in certain circumstances, may destabilize the regional situation, provoke a burst of military political tensions, and even lead to open uh, confrontation. My second point, world's uh, leading countries should pursue responsible policy in Asia Pacific. It is important to realize that no rebalancing, cyber rattling, military build up, policy of pressure, intimidation and containment of in or information aggression will solve our problems. On the contrary, they will aggravate the situation and sow the seeds of distrust, fostering an arms race in the region. Uh, if there will be opportunity for me, I would like uh, to uh, explain our attitude towards, for example, United States policy in this region. My third point. Uh, of course, we are not only ones uh, uh, to see this uneasy situation in the Asia-Pacific. We should uh, counteract unilateral approaches to the security architecture by upholding the international law and developing mutual respect to the national interest of every state. I want to emphasize that no country has the right to strengthen their security at the expense of other. My fourth point. We stand for convergence and synergy of ideas brought forward by all multilateral structures, uh, and we know about them, it's uh, East Asia Summit, ASEAN, Regi uh, ASEAN Regional Forum on Security, and uh, others. In 2013, together with China and Brunei, Russia launched the initiative to develop framework principles of security cooperation. Much has uh, to be done to uh, implement a Russian idea, and I am very much satisfied that other countries decided to take some ideas of our initiative, and they decided to develop them. For example, uh, China, Republic of Korea, Indonesia, and uh, other uh, countries. 
it is important to enshrine the great approaches to the concept paper on a comprehensive security in Asia Pacific. The ultimate goal would be a legally binding treaty. This should be a step-by-step -step process involving as many countries as uh, possible. My fifth point, we lack trust. Some of our colleagues say that the use of European experience would fix this. In our opinion, however, the realities of the Asia-Pacific region will not allow mechanical replication of confidence-building measures adopted in Europe. Moreover, in the course of the Ukrainian crisis, many of these measures have failed and have lost their credibility. What more can be done to build trust? It appears that we could and should start with voluntary transparency in our military activities, including mutual information sharing on uh, military exercise. There is exactly what the Russian Defense Ministry does. The practice of random operational readiness checkups, which causes so much concern uh, in NATO member states, we keep informing in good faith the military attitudes of the objectives and timelines of the drills. My sixth uh, point. We are actively developing bilateral military-to-military -military cooperation with Asia-Pacific region. And I am sure that if we redouble our efforts to develop military-to-military -military cooperation, it will help us uh, to build uh, trust uh, and create a good atmosphere for uh, cooperation. For example, out of more than 3,000 of foreign military personnel studying the Russian military educational establishment, we allocate more than half of them of the student quota to the Asia-Pacific countries. I have other uh, examples, but I would like to use just only 30 seconds uh, more, just only to say about uh, uh, Russian ideas, uh, ideas of Ministry of Defense, how to develop military-to-military -military, uh, cooperation. I just would like uh, to draw attention to uh, three uh, um, events uh, which we uh, have and we will have in uh, Moscow. First. Uh, I would like to draw your attention that uh, for the fourth year in a row, we are uh, hosting Moscow, in Moscow the Conference on International Security. This forum, which we held uh, in April, this April, has become a good tradition, and year after year it attracts more and more guests. This year the conference convened over 400 representatives from 70 countries and international organizations, including the UN, OSCE, SCO, and uh, CSTO. Moscow Conference has evolved into the important forum bringing together heads of uh, defense uh, ministries as well as prominent representatives of the academic community and NGO. Second, from 16 to 19 June this year, International Military Technical Forum Army 2015 will open its door to present modern capabilities of the Russian armed force as well as prospects for their development. I would like to say you that we would like to show, uh, to present our transparency about our plans. And if anybody has uh, interest to visit us, you are welcome. And third, International Army Games will take place in August 2015 in Moscow uh, outskirts. They will include 12 international competition in operational training scattered across 10 training ranges and the Caspian Sea. It seems to me that such competition between uh, military officers and soldiers will help us as well to build uh, trust uh, and understanding what we are doing. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for your passion. Thank you I very like much. For, thank, you. thank you very much for those uh, six points. And I think some of them uh, do echo the uh, first speaker's uh, points, especially this old issue of uh, how do we build uh, trust, which I'm sure will be a theme that we will be uh, spending quite a lot of time talking about. Uh, Air Marshal uh, Binskin. Thank you, Peter. As we've heard a number of times today, over the next 20 years, the strategic environment in Asia is likely to become more challenging. The states benefit from economic growth and look to modernise their capabilities as a result. And with ever-increasing regional and global interdependence, no country can act alone to resolve the challenges that threaten 
this region's security. In my view, all countries and defence force, forces represented here at this dialogue have a common interest in maintaining an international system based on the rule of law and backed by regular dialogue and strong cooperation, as well as a transparent approach to strategic interests. As a country's overall GDP rises, its defence spending typically rises in real terms, even if it is not as a percentage of that GDP. In fact, this is natural and legitimate. All countries want to be able to protect their national interests. But accelerating military modernisation also has the potential to increase strategic competition in the region, as states seek military advantages over their neighbours. It is therefore important for all countries in the region to be open about their defence policies and transparent in their long-term strategic intentions. Transparency can be manifested in a number of ways, whether it's a regular publication of a white paper or a similar document, through regular bilateral dialogues and or cooperation through multilateral forums. For example, Australia has a multi-pronged approach to regional security. The region's expanding multilateral forums provide a good means to enhance communication and transparency about military developments and to cooperate with each other for mutual benefit. So in, in order to do that, Australia is a member of the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, ASEAN Defence Ministers Meeting Plus, the Five Power Defence Arrangements, Western Pacific Naval Symposium, the Pacific Islands Forum, and we're a founding member of both the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium and the Indian Ocean Rim Association. Essential to the success of these forums, though, is ASEAN, the region's longest standing multilateral political and economic organisation. A cohesive ASEAN is critical to the security of the Southeast Asia and the broader region. And Australia has recognised this for many years, and this year marks our 41st anniversary as an ASEAN dialogue partner. And as I've already said, Australia is also an active member of the ASEAN Defence Ministers Meeting Plus, which has achieved some excellent practical security outcomes through a number of joint regional activities over the last few years. So these types of activities that have underscored more than anything the benefits of cooperation as opposed to competition on security issues with which affect all of us. But true cooperation can only occur when one essential element is present. And we've heard that a number of times, transparency. One aspect of this for us is our forthcoming Defence White Paper, which the Government will release in the second half of this year. The Defence White Paper will set out the Australian Government's vision for our defence strategy over the next two decades. It will also provide a clear guidance on what we, the Australian Defence Force and the Australian Defence Organisation, must be able to do and with what resources, both independently and, importantly, with our international partners. Further demonstrating a commitment to transparency and strategic planning, this White Paper will also set out our planned defence investments over the next 20 years. Now, the final point I would like to make is that military modernisation doesn't necessarily equate to military competition. Indeed, it's a positive thing for nations to be able to work together at the same capability level on security issues of mutual interest. But we can only reach this goal with strong partnerships and relationships built on communication and cooperation and free of one-up gamesmanship. And the multilateral framework that we have established in the region provides us with the best means to get to that point. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you very much. I think we again seeing uh, uh, certain themes recurring, the importance of transparency. But I think there's another uh, theme which perhaps we want to touch on during the discussion, which is regional architecture, which uh, was also a, a point which uh, uh, some of uh, the earlier speakers uh, touched on. So uh, we'll hold those points and we'll move to uh, Mr. Kanihara. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Ho. Uh, Japanese are always accused of making no jokes in the beginning, but today nobody did, so I'm relaxed today. <laughs> 2,300 years ago, Chinese philosopher Mencius stressed that when there is a law under the heavens, Tian Sha Yo Dao, the moral and wise will rule, but if there's no law under the heavens, Tian Sha Yo Dao, the big and the strong will prevail. Mencius says this is the way of heavens, and any country who defies the will of the heavens must perish. 
For many countries in Asia, 19th and 20th centuries were a time without law and other heavens. Many countries went through great difficulties. Some countries hardly maintained their independence. Others became colonies and some colonies and semi-colonies, and wars and revolutions devastated Asia. After securing independence even, strong governments were needed for stability and development. Authoritarian regimes emerged in several forms, some under dictatorship, the military, some under communist regime. Cold War brought cold peace to Europe, but in Asia, proxy wars like the Korean War or Vietnam War happened and flared. Lost, lots of lives were lost. However, in the latter half of the 20th century, rule of law came back to Asia. Most of the countries in Asia gained independence. Racial discrimination was put to, to its end. East and South Asian countries achieved spectacular economic development. With end of the Cold War, East-West confrontation in Asia disappeared. Today, Asian countries share universal moral grounds, independence, freedom, basic human rights, democracy, market economy, correction of social and economic disparities, outlawry of war, and free trade. These are the universal values achieved and shared among Asian people. We are all headed for the bright future. Today in Asia, liberal, system, liberal systems are functioning based on these universal values. What is a liberal system? It is a system that accredits equal value to anybody. It is a system that recognizes everybody's rights and responsibility to participate in the construction and transformation of the system, regardless of skin color, religion, political thoughts, political regimes. It is a system that does not allow the outrage of a powerful country, and it is a system that is functioning and that is based upon law, rules, and consensus. ASEAN is a great success story in this regard. ASEAN is now a, a model and at the center of fusion and creation of a new Asia. In order to achieve in order, to, uh, in order to have such liberal systems function, all countries in Asia must share the belief that law does exist under the heavens, as once stated by Mencius. And Mencius continues, heavens cannot see and cannot hear. So heaven sees and hears through people's eyes and people's, people's ears, and heaven's will is people's will. This is a statement 2,300 years ago. And if agents can share confidence in the system, trust in others, and believe that the legitimacy comes from the consent of the people, we can achieve a new Asia in the 21st century. Europeans could do this. Can we do that? Yes, we can. Love taught by Christianity underlay the European community. Love was the moral ground of modern European world. Likewise, Confucianism teaches ren, benevolence. Buddhism and Hinduism teaches compassion, Islam teaches brotherhood. These are, there are several paths to reach the spiritual heights. This is Vivekananda, Indian philosopher, stated, diversity is not weakness. Diversity is the source of creativity. Diversity gives energy for fusion, synergy, and creation of a new Asia. With mutual trust, law must prevail. Going back to a world of, uh, without law is not possible. It's simply means heading back to the 19th century. We cannot go back to the dark age. If that happens, that will trigger a huge arms race here. They have money today, the Asians, and that will throw away a huge amount of money to the unnecessary arms race. A massive budget should be used for improving people's lives here in Asia, and not for military expansion. Whereas the military budget is the size of Japanese national budget, one trillion dollars. If we double this, this, our next generation will call us stupid. We can't do that. Another concern is there's a growing tension in South China Sea and East China Sea. No one can control the sea. This is a law. Sea must be free and peaceful. No matter how large an airport is built on the islands, and artificial islands cannot have their territorial waters. Even if fighter jets or cannons are deployed on the islands, those countries who uphold freedom of the sea will never give in. While the idea of exclusive economic zone spread in the 1970s, Japan, together with China and South Korea, sought the possibility of a joint development of the management of fishery, oil, and mineral resources. This is the way to go for Southeast Asia, too. 
Last year here at the Shangri-La Dialogue, Prime Minister Abe of Japan proposed three principles of the rule of the, rule of the law at sea. The first, states shall make and clarify their claims based on the international law. Second, states shall not use force or coercion in trying to drive their claims. Third, states shall seek to settle disputes by peaceful means. The reality in Asia is that these principles need to be addressed again. We have some hope here too. There's an excellent case, an agreement between Indonesia and the Philippines on the delimitation of the overlapping EZ was reached. It is important to support such efforts by the Philippines. We need efforts to seek solutions to the disputes in the South China Sea through rule of law and negotiations, rules and consensus. Today, if there is anything that might close the window of opportunity that is wide open to a new Asia, that goes against the law under the heavens. A new Asia can emerge only through the synergy of various countries, cultures, religions and values in the liberal system. We are witnessing the creation of new Asia today. Asia is taking back its original position, original size in the world history again. No country is entitled to destroy this opportunity by putting the clock back to the 19th century. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Again, a, a lot of the same themes are being echoed, but I note that there is uh, one new idea on the table, and that is the idea of joint uh, development. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Friedberg. Thank you very much. Uh, you'll note that I am the only uh, panelist who is not a government official, which means that I am not bound to be diplomatic. Uh, so I will tell you up front my conclusions and then elaborate on them. Uh, first, the title of our panel is Avoiding Military Competition and Arms Racing in Asia, uh, in my view, uh, we cannot avoid military competition in Asia. It's already underway. The question is whether we can avoid something that truly deserves to be referred to as an arms race. I'll elaborate on that in a moment. And then secondly, uh, this is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, there's a dynamic stability that can merge out of competition, and especially if the alternative is for one side to grow stronger and the other not to increase its strength, uh, the risks may be even greater. So let me elaborate on that, uh, making four points. The title of the panel, which I referred to a moment ago, uh, suggests a distinction between military competition and arms racing, which I think is appropriate and useful. Uh, and in my view, this is a matter of degree. Uh, the scope and intensity of the interdependence or coupling between the military programs or two, uh, of two or more states or coalitions may vary. Uh, and it is possible, I think, to have a degree of military competition without something that might truly deserve to be referred to as an arms race. Arms racing, in my view, implies a very tight coupling or interdependence between the military efforts of two sides whose military programs, research and development plans and so on come to focus increasingly on one another. Secondly, uh, in Asia, there are many possible axes of military competition, uh, some more active than others, although none, I think, yet deserving to be termed uh, an arms race. The U.S.-China axis is clearly the most important, and I'll say a few more words about that, but there are others as well. Uh, China and Japan, to some degree, are engaged in military co uh, competition, China and India to some degree, and might be conceivably more so in the future, uh, South Korea and North Korea. Uh, it's conceivable, although obviously it would be very undesirable uh, for South Korea and Japan to be engaged in military competition. I don't think they are yet, but they could conceivably be. Third point, uh, military competition between the United States and China has been underway, in my view, for over two decades now. And in fact, we're entering into the third phase of this competition, which may be bringing us closer to something that deserves to be termed an arms race. The first phase uh, really extends from roughly 1991 to 2001. Uh, so from the first Gulf War and the collapse of the Soviet Union until the September 11th attacks in the United States and everything that followed from them. 
During this period, the United States was overwhelmingly dominant in military terms in the world and in the Asia-Pacific region, and in particular, it had an essentially unrestricted capacity to project military power throughout the region. Uh, China was not in a position during this time to actively, directly challenge American military preponderance, but Chinese military strategists began to study uh, American capabilities and to focus on ways of countering those capabilities, and in particular, countering the American capacity to project conventional military power at great range. Uh, their diagnosis of the problem was that the United States had developed what the Soviets had termed a reconnaissance strike complex. And the prescription, I think, uh, was that China needed to build one of its own, needed to develop the capacity to strike at U.S. forward-based forces and facilities in order to preclude the possibility that the United States might use its military power against China. And the capabilities that followed from this thinking began to be deployed in the mid uh, to late 1990s, what came to be referred to in the United States as uh, China's anti-access area denial capabilities began to emerge and emerge more clearly by the turn of the century. The second phase of this competition uh, begins, I think, in 2001, and uh, somewhat arbitrarily, I would say, it extends for another 10 years and ended in 2011. Uh, if you look at the 2001 Quadrennial Defense Review in the United States, you see that it contains a very uh, detailed description of what would later come to be referred to as the anti-access challenge and lays out a number of prescriptions for dealing with it. But of course, that report was due to be published uh, right around September 11th. And the events of September 11th uh, had a major impact on the world and on the U.S. military in particular uh, and distracted the United States, deflected it, I think, from focusing on this challenge for the better part of a decade. During this period, China's capabilities evolved further, uh, but to a considerable degree, the United States didn't respond because it was so preoccupied with problems elsewhere. Uh, as the Bush administration was coming to an end, the second term of the Bush administration, it began to turn back towards the question of uh, the shifting military balance in Asia. But just as that process began, the second unanticipated event of that decade occurred, namely the financial crisis, uh, which further constrained the U.S. response. So that second phase is characterized by an intensifying competition, but a fairly one-sided one. And so that brings us to the third stage where we are now. Uh, I said the date 2011 is somewhat arbitrary, but this is when the United States began to talk about the pivot, when it announced the creation of the Air-Sea Battle Office and so on. Uh, and the U.S. has become increasingly focused on the Asia-Pacific region and on China as a potential military opponent. And there has been growing concern over the possible implications of China's increasing anti-access area denial capabilities, as well as its, uh, as perceived in the U.S. and also in the region, its more assertive behavior in the so-called gray zone contingencies. And the United States has begun to respond in a serious way, although the precise scope and details of its response have yet to be worked out. Uh, two things seem clear as to what the U.S. is doing. Uh, basically, it's taking steps that are intended to ensure a continued American ability to project power into the region, despite China's evolving and increasingly capable anti-access area denial network. As to why it's doing that, uh, I think the answer is that it is generally agreed in the United States that continued access to the region under any circumstances is essential uh, to upholding uh, the American security guarantees that are the basis for U.S. alliances in the region, and also that maintaining that capacity under any circumstances is critical to uh, the U.S. ability to defend freedom of navigation through the waters of the region. Fourth and final point, uh, to some extent, and I wouldn't want to overstate this, but to some extent, uh, an intensified military competition between the United States and China is un, uh, unavoidable. As I've said, it's already underway. The only way in which I think it could be avoided would be for one of three things to happen, no one of which seems likely to me. The first would be for China to slow, stop, and perhaps reverse 
uh, the expansion of its capabilities. The second would be for the United States simply not to respond to the growth of Chinese capabilities. And the third, although I wouldn't dismiss it out of hand, I don't think it's very likely for the time being, would be for the two sides to come to some kind of arms control agreements that might damp down the competitive tendencies. As I said at the outset, and again, I wouldn't want to overstate this, but military competition isn't always a bad thing, although it can be a dangerous thing. Uh, it can lead to a dynamic stability in which potential opponents are both deterred from using force or threats of force against one another. And under some circumstances, that's preferable to the alternative, which would be a balance of power which is deteriorating from the point of view of the United States and its regional friends and allies. Thank you. Uh, th thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Friedberg. Um, I think you have uh, uh, made a very interesting assertion that uh, military competition, particularly on the US-China axis, uh, is already in existence and has been in existence for quite a while. And uh, the only thing we uh, should uh, try to avoid is trying to avoid having this military competition escalating to some form of uh, arms race. Uh, and uh, perhaps uh, we will uh, take it from there and see whether anybody wants to challenge your assertion. But we've got uh, several uh, issues on the table about how we would uh, generally want to create a framework that would discourage uh, countries in the region and even extra-regional powers from wanting to engage in some form of military competition and certainly uh, from uh, getting into any kind of structured uh, arms race. And there are many ideas uh, there, the ideas about the importance of uh, trust, importance of uh, developing uh, 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 proper regional architecture, the importance of uh, international uh, law, uh, importance of uh, transparency, and uh, some very practical uh, uh, suggestions. So I, uh, with that, I thank all our five uh, speakers for more or less keeping to the five-minute uh, deadline. And can I now open the floor uh, for questions, uh, comments? I, what I propose to do is I'll take a, a, a few uh, questions at a time and then uh, ask, as appropriate, uh, the panelists to respond. So the floor is open. I'm, I'm sorry, I really uh, cannot, uh, my eyesight is really bad. I can't see anybody's name. Uh, if I can start off uh, first, Mr. Auslin. And yeah. You, you, you don't have a mic, you, you just press the button. That's it, yeah. thank right. you. Thank you, gentlemen, for very interesting presentations. I wonder if we could get a little bit more specific about the threat to commercial shipping, which was raised this morning uh, in various ways. Uh, I don't necessarily share the characterization uh, of uh, Ashton Carter about the threat from China to commercial shipping, but whether he's right or I'm right uh, is not important. Uh, what are the prospects for setting up more active and robust working group amongst Asia-Pacific nations on the threats to commercial shipping and the protection of commercial shipping, noting that it's China's military doctrine to participate actively in international cooperation to protect commercial shipping. Okay, thank you. Um, next, next, yep. So I, I just have uh, uh, comments and uh, questions. The comments is now, that now today we are discussing how to avoid the military competition and uh, arms race. I think two things are very important. The first is now, for all the military troops, their number one issue is to prepare for the worst-case scenario, especially between China and the U.S., and maybe China and Japan. So, yes, this is the military forces' duty. They should do so. But on the other side, we should try our best to make efforts for the most possible future and the, most, the, the best future. Otherwise, we will fall into the Cold War thinking, just uh, the, 
the zero sum thinking. So prepare for the worst case scenario, but at the same time should try our best to, to, to make efforts for the possible uh, better future. That's one point. Secondly, I think nowadays in order to avoid the military arms race, to strengthen uh, crisis management, especially bilateral crisis management, is very important. For example, between China and Japan. In 2008, we reached a very important, very good agreement between two leaders. But uh, because in 2010 to 2012, two crises. Then after that, so during a period of time, both countries even went to the brink of a war. Uh, the, the, the threat of perception has increased so much. So I think if we have the bilateral crisis management, uh, the situation could be different. So very important, not just between China and Japan, for a lot of countries. Finally, a question uh, for uh, Dr. Aaron. I think your uh, presentation is very interesting. And uh, uh, my question is, uh, what is the definition of military competition and what is the definition of uh, arms race? So then we can know what is the real difference between these two, two things. Thank you. Thank you. Um, gentleman right opposite me, uh, Mr. Okay, anyway, please. <laughs> I'm sorry. Need a binoculars here. I have a confession to make. Right. I'm not Mr. Biscop. All right. My name is Fen Hampson. I'm from Canada. I just invaded Belgium because I don't okay. have a name tag. <laughs> okay. um, Canadian governments will be better than Belgian governments. Um, <laughs> welcome. There's the physical hardware competition dynamic that was described uh, so ably, I would say brilliantly, by Dr. Friedberg. And then there's the virtual cyber competition, which some would say has already entered the conflictual phase. And my question uh, is not a simple one, uh, but I will try to state it simply. Does cyber follow the same rules or trajectory that we see in physical space or is it going to increasingly become a proxy for physical warfare? And secondly, are there any incentives for crisis management and confidence building measures of the kind that not just the speakers of this panel, but other speakers have uh, talked about in the cyber realm in the uh, China-U.S. relationship. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think that's a very uh, interesting as well as a very important question, and I hope uh, the panelists will be able to uh, touch on touch on that question. Uh, the lady at the corner. Uh, the flat button, ah. right? Thank you. Uh, I, I have uh, two more abstract uh, questions. One is about the relationship between trust and confidence, which for a German is very hard because there is actually only one word for trust and confidence. Um, usually in Europe we believe that confidence building measures build trust. In Asia I always hear that you need trust in order to start confidence building measures. So I hope that one of the panelists will sort of clarify the relationship right. between the two. And the other question is about uh, something that was asked in an earlier session but not answered then. Is transparency always a good thing? Is it a good thing from the perspective of weak countries? One uh, traditional argument the Chinese side used to make was we can't be transparent because everybody will know how weak we really are. 
There are, I wouldn't say that this is true for China today, but there are other smaller countries that are truly weak and might not be quite as interested in transparency. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tanner. Thank you very much. I'm, from the, uh, I'm the special advisor of the Secretary General of the OECE, and I'd also like to say a few words about confidence building measures and transparency building measures. Uh, specific also with regard to a comment made by Deputy uh, Minister of Defense Antonov. He argued that actually CSBMs did not work with regard to Ukraine. And here I think it's important to retain that CSBMs cannot prevent war. Uh, they can uh, help to avoid uh, unintentional conflict, misperceptions, um, and they can help to, to, uh, for de-escalation if the political will is there. In fact, with regard to Ukraine, uh, the Vienna document has been used, uh, actually the key confidence building measure document of the OEC has been used uh, in record, uh, record amount. Um, last year there were actually uh, 25, uh, 21 verification uh, activities in Ukraine and nine in Russian Federation. That was combined by some states with open skies, overflights to validate this data. So I think there has been a lot of use. Actually, some chapters were used for the very first time uh, in the history of, of the Vienna document. So I think, again, um, it can be used in bad weather situations, but again, cannot prevent war. It's very, I think it's an important point. But having said that, I'd just like to ask a, a specific question to the Dep before, a Deputy Minister of Defense. Um, he, he mentioned a number of activities from Russia uh, in the next uh, few uh, weeks and months, and also mentioned, of course, the Moscow conference I had the opportunity to attend uh, two years ago, which was very interesting. But I don't think you mentioned this Russian-Chinese naval exercise which just took place. And it's quite curious to see, actually, that there are now Chinese warships in the Mediterranean exercising together with Russia. Is this a, a kind of feat, a special event, or is this part of a broader approach uh, to strengthening uh, Chinese-Russian uh, uh, cooperation? Uh, and uh, is this, uh, I don't know, of course, to what extent, like interpretation, what is the Chinese objectives to start to, to do maneuvers in, in, in actually in, in Europe and in the Mediterranean? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I've got about five questions. I'll take all of them, and then we will uh, uh, ask the panelists to respond. Mr. Allen? The, the flat button. Got it? Oh, okay, you, I think we, we will. Uh, sorry, Sorry, just to repeat, I wonder how the prospect of dynamic stability is affected by these other axes of competition that you spoke about at the outset. Uh, I can't remember how many years ago it was that Survival published a brilliant article by yourself with the title, I think, Will Europe's Past Be Asia Fu Asia's Future? And the analogy that occurs to me now is that the buildup of I, – I, this has, actually isn't what the article was about, as I recall – but the, uh, the, the buildup of West European powers in the Cold War and even nuclear powers um, contributed, I think, to stability and to the eventual resolution of that competition. But would it work that way in this region? Thank you. Um, Mr. Takagi? No, the, you have to press the button. Oh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I had one question uh, to uh, Professor Friedberg, but before going to that, I'd like to comment on uh, a statement made by my old uh, Chinese friend, Mr. Jean Tuoshan. I was uh, very surprised, even shocked, to hear him say that uh, we <coughs> went to the brink of war in the 2010 and 12. Yes, uh, we experienced the rather tense moments. And uh, I, as a student of Chinese affairs, I didn't uh, notice at that time that uh, Chinese media, some media, uh, were full of uh, <clears throat> uh, war talks. But uh, that was not 
exception in Japan at all. And uh, I was very uh, surprised to hear what he had to say. My question to Professor Friesberg is this. I, I found your uh, discussion of uh, military competition and uh, arms race uh, quite interesting. But uh, what, uh, and you of course uh, talked about uh, axes uh, other than US-China. And uh, my, my neighbor just raised uh, other axes, uh, including Japan-China. But uh, in the Japan-China axis, uh, I don't think we have a genuine military uh, competition. But what is involved here is the uh, use of uh, technically non-military government ships uh, charged with uh, uh, law enforcement uh, duties. Those ships are sent to uh, the uh, problem areas uh, from China, and the Japanese side is also re responding by enhancing the capability of Coast Guard. Do you think this kind of uh, phenomenon uh, more functional in, in terms of uh, preventing military competition or uh, arms race, or do you think this is a, uh, the uh, initial stage of uh, rather dangerous uh, dynamics? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Surya Ranyana? Yeah. Uh, the Asian panelists here certainly will be well aware that the ADMM Plus started more for the purpose of bringing about cooperative security on issues like maritime security, etc. But I'm just wondering whether the panelists would address this possibility, if at all, of the ADMM Plus focusing as well on, say, discussing issues of shifting its focus over to issues of managing military competition, including cyber security issues. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Espen Bartaide from the uh, was there somewhere? Yeah. Espen Bartaide from the World Economic Forum. Um, we we discuss this now in an Asian regional setting, but needless to say, uh, strategic competition between China and the U.S. and U.S. allies is also a global phenomenon, has global implication that should also be understood in a global setting. And that's in a world where we see similar patterns of strategic competition between, for instance, Russia and Europe over Ukraine, and even the Middle East, although it looks like chaos, can also be seen like a you know, Shia, Sunni, or, or Persian, Arab competition, strategic competition. My question to the panel is if, if we indeed are seeing a world which is now dominated by sets of strategic competition, what does that mean for the overall system? And will globalization as we knew it over the last 20 years continue? Good question. And I got a lady who is sitting behind. You've got one question, and uh, then I'll turn this over to the panel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Marianne Hansen from the University of Queensland in Australia. Um, I'm glad to hear that people are talking about things like confidence building and transparency measures. And the CSCE, of course, is, is one of the, uh, the crucibles for developing these ideas. Um, one thing that comes to mind that could be done in this region without compromising the security of the states involved, I think, would be to make some move on de-alerting the nuclear forces that are currently on high alert status. Um, if we're talking about reducing crisis escalation, if we're talking about reducing the risks of nuclear use, either by design or by accident, then it seems to me that this is a, a step, a small step, that could be taken which could generate a, a substantial degree of trust and assuredness. Thank you. Now, I've got a uh, really widespread of uh, questions and comments uh, uh, from the floor. What I propose to do is I propose to move uh, in the order we started speaking from uh, my right uh, to left. Uh, Dr. Friedberg, you've got a lot of questions, so I'll give you a bit of time to think about how you want to respond to those uh, questions. But uh, perhaps I'll start with... Uh, 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 Mr. Burkhalter and uh, uh, your, your response to uh, the many questions uh, which, uh, uh, which were uh, raised and uh, perhaps uh, you, you might uh, uh, kick, kick off. Yep. Yeah. 
Thank you very much for giving me the second time to kick off, the second half time. Um, and um, well, I would focus on the uh, question about uh, confidence building measures. Uh, if I uh, summarize the question about that, I could say that you have uh, answered, you have questioned about CBMs uh, on the cybersphere uh, in China and US. And you have also asked a very interesting question about trust. Do we need trust at the beginning or at the end of confidence building measures? And uh, I would add a question which was also during, uh, which was also in the line, in, or between the lines of the different intervention of the panel. Can CBMs be very effective at the end of the day? And um, my answer is in one sense that we have to build bridges. A first bridge for the question about uh, China and US, a bridge between Euro-Atlantic, Eurasian and Asian uh, security. We have, uh, for instance, during the tensions in Europe last year and already for a little bit the year before, we have worked on these um, uh, issues of uh, CBMs on cybersphere uh, without any difficulties, and that uh, showed that it is very important to work on a comprehensive uh, strategic level for security. And despite the tensions, it was possible to decide on a package of confidence building measures. Uh, about uh, cybersphere for the Euro-Atlantic and Eurasian region, region. And then I think we can build a bridge more and more about security between this region, Euro-Atlantic, Euro-Eurasian, and Asian. And therefore it is interested to have this Shangri-La dialogue. Therefore it is interesting to have also um, a, a seminar with uh, Asian, Asian Europe meeting about these questions, and therefore it is also interesting to have ASEAN working in these questions. And uh, I think we can then bring also um, China and US to work on these sort of packages of confidence building measures uh, regarding, um, uh, regarding cybersphere. About trust before or after, it may, I don't, I'm not uh, in a position to uh, really understand everything in Asia, but I think uh, you're right to say it's very difficult to, to, to bring confidence building measures to have trust because we, we here in Asia need trust at the beginning. But it is, at the end, another bridge, a cultural one. We have to be realistic. Um, if we just wait trust, we can wait a long time, and then we have to leave the worst experience, like the first uh, questioner said before. And I think we, we don't have to, to, to wait so long, and we have to understand that cooperative security in a, in a general sense uh, will be a vehicle to create trust, but we have to work together for that and not, not be dependent on having trust at the beginning. It's not possible. And another and last question about effectivity of these confidence building measures. That is another bridge, actually. These confidence building measures are a bridge. We build a bridge with confidence building measures, but at the end, we cannot push the political responsible persons to walk along the bridge if they don't want to then there is a political responsibility and there is an issue of, of leadership and vision and strategy. And when you said um, during your um, intervention that uh, the um, OSCE couldn't solve the Ukraine crisis, that's true. But we have built all bridges that were possible to build. At the end of the day, political responsible of the different parties have to, to show the will to walk on that bridge. And therefore, I think really confidence building measures at the end trust and then leadership, political leadership, that is a solution in Asia as well.
thank you very much. I, I, I do hope that the uh, panelists will uh, address this question of trust and confidence and also this related question of whether transparency is always a good thing. Uh, that, that's an important philosophical question. Can I now turn the floor to Mr. Antonov? You've also got a few questions directed at you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I would like uh, to thank my Chinese colleague who raised a very interesting uh, uh, question. Competition and arms race. arms race. What is it? So if we bring more weapons, ships, tanks into this region, is it for competition or it is arms race? But at the same time, we remember that if you want peace, stability, you have to be prepared for a war. If you want to keep stability, your army has to be equipped with sophisticated weapons. Your personnel has to be prepared for a war. And if your Opponent, opponent, opponent see that you equipped and armed with sophisticated, for example, weapons, he will not start a war. So that's why, frankly, as to me, I don't know how to find uh, a definition for competition and arms range. Competition, it's mean, for me, it's a good diplomatic word. <laughs> to close the substance of arms race. So it's the first. Then uh, what I would like to say, uh, the uh, second, transparency is good or bad? Uh, yes, uh, uh, you're right that the first time, it was maybe 20 years ago, I heard from my Chinese colleagues that transparency is a weapon of a uh, weak partner. Uh, I would like, for example, uh, to disclose some elements of so-called Vasina arrangement, which we agreed 20 years ago. Vasina arrangements, uh, Vasina arrangement, yes. Uh, this instrument regarding, is uh, controlling the arms supply and you'll use goods and technology to third countries. And there was a question, whether we have to inform our partners about all arms supply and suddenly we discovered that, for example, importers of arms don't want us to send, for example, information about their uh, purchase of arms and ammunition to headquarters of Vasinar arrangement. So again, I just would like to confirm that transparency is a weapon of a weak nation. So that's why I, uh, there is not uh, possible to find an... Uh, uh, an answer, just only one word or one sentence, transparency is a good or bad. In general term of con for us, we are in favor of transparency and we will support a reasonable uh, measure for, uh, for example, CBM for uh, transparency. As to, uh, Mr. Tenere, your question, a very interesting question, but uh, I just would like to remind you what I have just said, that uh, I uh, made a point that we lack trust. And I said that some of my colleagues say that the use of European experience would fix this. As to me, I disagree with those uh, European colleagues that it's possible, that it's very easy to, for example, create an Asia OEC type uh, mechanism. Uh, if you ask me what Asia needs, I don't know because taking into account current situation, uh, for us, it's too premature to uh, speak about the necessity to create something like OSE. Maybe another mechanism. I don't know. That's why I said that we have to start from voluntary uh, transparency measures. And uh, I mentioned what we are doing regarding, for example, our uh, training exercises. I understand that some countries, of course, uh, are not satisfied with our transparency, but as I mentioned many times, uh, inviting military attaché, inviting press, that we will continue these efforts. And moreover, it's very interesting that there was an idea to invite Mr. Stoltenberg to our uh, training exercise. I'm not sure that he will not come, but you see that uh, he explained his concern regarding the operation of uh, Russian armed forces. 
and uh, we discussed with my minister and suddenly idea came into our uh, heads that maybe it's better to invite him to to provide him opportunity to see what we are doing, that there is no any uh, danger or uh, there is no uh, challenge for uh, NATO uh, forces. So I would like to say you that uh, we are in favor of confidence building measures, but I uh, didn't, I haven't said that uh, confidence building measures can prevent war. I haven't said uh, this. I said that uh, as to Vienna document, Open Sky Treaty, I don't want to discuss this issue because not all of us are aware of these documents, but these documents are regarding the transparency uh, because I know that there is a lot of opportunity to circumvent treaties and confidence building measures agreement. And I hope that uh, military diplomats and diplomats uh, uh, understand what I am uh, talking about. It's very easy also to circumvent uh, key uh, treaties regarding the international stability or security. As to uh, Russian and Chinese exercise, you uh, have raised an issue whether it is a special event or it's a broader or it's a part of broader plan for cooperation. I would like to say you that it's a special event of a plan for broader cooperation. <laughs> so. Uh, we are very much, uh, and you are right that I haven't mentioned it because, as I said to you, that I have prepared a long speech, and if you are interested, I will provide you this uh, speech in written form, and you will find the reference uh, to, to this exercise. Uh, we consider that uh, we have a friendship with uh, China, not against anybody. We just uh, would like to cooperate together. We would like uh, to see our countries uh, stable, <coughs> peaceful. We don't want uh, anybody uh, uh, tries to attack us or to be prepared to attack us. We would like to understand what uh, Chinese army uh, is doing, and we would like them, I mean our Chinese colleagues, uh, understand what we are doing, because we are neighbors, we are friends, it's, it's a strategic uh, partnership. Uh, we uh, have started such exercises, and we continue such uh, exercises um, in the future. And the final maybe point, Mr. Chairman, uh, it's not uh, regarding uh, the uh, title of our conversation, but there was a uh, reference regarding the strategic competition between Russia and NATO. I cannot avoid to say a few words about it. The problem, uh, it's, it's about few words, just sure. only a few words. It's uh, very difficult to identify what does it mean uh, a few words, <laughs> like a competition or uh, arms race. But I'll try, Mr. Chairman. Right. The problem is not Ukraine. The problem between uh, NATO and Russia appeared many, many years ago when the Soviet Union dismantled or dissolved. It's our tragedy, but uh, uh, at this stage I just would like to stop and say that there was a lot of elements in NATO position uh, create a lot of problems for uh, Russian Federation. And Ukraine has become just only a trigger, trigger for uh, um, such bad, uh, bad relations between NATO and Russia. As I promise you, I will yeah. stop. And if anybody would thank, like thank you. I think a little will, more, I am ready. We will save that for, for another uh, 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 Shangri-La dialogue. Uh, <laughs> and Marshal Binskin. <laughs> thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I think I'll take a different view on different perspective on transparency and uh, I think if I go to Mr Austin's first uh, question which was uh, I think you were based around Secretary Carter's comment about the threat to commercial shipping with, uh, with what was going on at the moment and whether that's debatable and in fact it probably is debatable and I, and I can't speak for Secretary Carter because I didn't talk to him specifically on it but I think he might have been looking at the, uh, the potential longer term uh, impacts of what were, were going on. So if I go back to the word threat, first of all, uh, in simple terms, a threat is based on capability and intent. Uh, and as we know, capability takes a long time to build up. There's, uh, it's the individual weapon systems, the training, the personnel, the logistics, the support, and then the integration of those systems, the ability to, to base, to be able to operate, to be able to work together. And so that takes a long time to, to build. Um, intent, though, 
uh, which is the other part of, uh, of a threat, uh, can change quickly. Uh, and it can change quickly with the strategic uh, in environment. So if then I was to take the, the fact that uh, the threat uh, for anything, even if it was commercial shipping, was based on capability and intent, if I was then to go to, I think the German lady uh, over here was talking about uh, trust and confidence, and I, I'm not going to get into the European about which, which is what and what come, comes first, but you asked, is transparency always a good thing uh, or not? And uh, I would say uh, it, it is, and this is where I might be a bit, bit different to my colleague next to me. And in this thing, I'm, this area, I'm not talking about transparency just in the weapons capability side, which I think was where you're coming from. I'm uh, looking more at transparency down the intent side, so the, the transparency in what, what, what people might be doing and, uh, and, and why. And uh, not trying to pick on China, and I'll be up, up front here, I'm not trying to pick on them, but it's, it is the easiest one to use at the moment in this, uh, this transparency debate. And, and so what many people are seeking around the region uh, at the moment is not transparency in the uh, particular weapon systems and, and, and all that. It's uh, transparency on what's the, the intent, the longer term intent with what's going on. Um, and I think we've heard a number of people uh, talk about uh, what appears to be happening in the South China Sea is the seeking to change the facts on the ground uh, without clarification of the, the claims. That's the, uh, the transparency people are, are seeking. Uh, and I know that a number of people have called on China to be open and clarify its position, for example, on the nine-dotted line in, a, in accordance with the international law. Uh, and, and what comes out when that discussion is there is, uh, and I had the privilege of visiting the South China Sea Institute on Hainan Island just before Christmas last year, uh, currently the transparency that sits around that comes down to a legal position based on two things. One was a hand-drawn... Uh, cartographer uh, nine dots uh, back in the early 1900s and the other was a nationalist government statement in 1947 and that's the only legal, in, legal basis that currently is put up in that argument so people are feeling that that's not enough for uh, in a transparency sense as to why that claim is there and so people are seeking transparency uh, and the region seeking transparency in better understanding what the intent is behind what is happening there so Hopefully that helps in a, in a different perspective here in the transparency side. Thank you. You want to say anything about ADMM class and cyber? Uh, yeah, uh, just a little bit. And there are a number of uh, working groups in the ADMM plus, expert working groups, and I was just trying to go through my mind whether there is one on cyber or, or not. But potentially, down track, there may be a, uh, in that, uh, that forum to, uh, to establish an expert working group on... Uh, yeah on cyber to, to look at all the issues that, right. uh, that are there. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, Kani Harrison. Thank you, Mr. Hall. I wish to pick up the question of that gentleman. Um, if the arms race continues all over the world, what was the impact of our system? I don't believe that Ukraine is a difficult, difficult issue, but I don't believe that that would bring Europeans, Americans, and Russians back to Cold War, that huge confrontation of nuclear, nuclear stocks. But a Chinese problem is I th we, have, we have to pay attention to China's problem here. The reason is that simply the magnitude. Ten years ago, Chinese military budget was smaller than Japan's military budget. Today, whole world's military expenditure is roughly our, our national budget size, less than one trillion dollars. Half is American budget. Ten percent of American budget is Japan, UK, France, Germany, G7 average is 10% of the United States. Ten years ago, Chinese budget was smaller than ours. Today, it's three times bigger than Japan's military budget. That means Japan, UK, France combined. If that continues, if Chinese military budget reaches 50% of the United States, what would happen? This, is, this triggers considerations. We don't believe that we have to keep pace with China. We don't do that, because we are in alliance with the United States. But even with the United States, China becomes heavy. And this is the question to address for us. It is very difficult to sit together to talk about arms reduction with rising power, because they believe that it is not fair. 
that what we felt in London, Washington, naval arms reduction talks in 1930s. But this is a mistake, because world system can solve many, many problems. There's no, there was no necessity to prepare total war. But if a nation does not believe a system, then to prepare the eventuality of total war, this arms race is limitless. And this is so stupid. We have to stop this. Um, Aaron mentioned three scenarios to stop arms race between US and China. I have a fourth scenario. That is the change of military, um, change of the balance of budgetary priorities, military and civil affairs. We pay a lot for pension, for Medicare. 30 trillion yen, it's, it is 300 billion dollars, go to pension, Medicare. So we can't pay a lot for the military. Americans are complaining, but we can, can't do that. <laughs> and, but this is, the, this is this world. We don't have to prepare any total war. And we can solve these issues peacefully. And, but if China continues to raise military budget to two, two digits every year, you can easily reach half size of the US budget. That would trigger the arms race, truly. That is my comment. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Can I just much. say one yeah, more? Please. Uh, CBM and OSC types things, uh, this will not work in Asia. But this is very professional between the two blocks. I was leading once the naval talks with Russians for avoiding the, the incident. Um, my counterpart was Admiral from St. Petersburg. He said, you are my counterpart? I said, yes. He was very dis disappointed, but we <laughs> did it. The talks, these are professional talks. We compare logs. This is possible only when a very professional people meet together under great pressure of nuclear confrontation. Today's Asia is not that. Low intensity conflicts everywhere. We have to build something here. European type CBM does not work in Asia, at least, um, at, at least uh, for some time now. Nuclear weapon, the same thing. Somebody asked, asked a question whether nuclear weapons would be stabilizing in Asia. It is not stabilizing in Asia. This is not to block confrontation here. Threat perceptions are very different. North Korea cannot be deterred, even though we have nuclear talks with, say, China, US. North Korea is apart. Asia is very various, and Asia is not block confrontation system here. A nuclear weapon is not, can never be stabilizing with these, say, countries like North Korea. Thank you. Okay, th thank you for that interesting insight. Dr. Friedberg, you, you have a lot of questions, but try to keep it brief. Well, thank you. Um, let me just briefly run through the questions that, that I think were directed at me. First, I don't have a a very satisfying answer about the difference between a military competition and an arms race. To me, it's a matter of degree. Uh, you can imagine at one extreme, countries modernizing their forces but not really focused on one another. Uh, and you can imagine at the other extreme, two countries who care about nothing but what the other does and make all of their preparations uh, according to their judgment about their uh, potential opponent. But I think there are a lot of things in between where countries are modernizing their capabilities, are concerned about various contingencies, are perhaps developing some hedges against uh, the capabilities of potential opponents, but are not fully locked into what I would call an arms race. A um, question was raised about cyber uh, and whether it will become a proxy for physical warfare. I don't know about that, but it does seem, from what I understand, uh, that cyber creates some very worrisome possibilities uh, particularly in a severe crisis, that there may be some similarities uh, in the capabilities or perceived capabilities of cyber uh, and nuclear weapons in that parties might feel that there was a strong incentive to strike first. Um, as to whether there are incentives for uh, crisis management or arms control in the cyber realm, um, I know some people are talking about this and thinking about it. It seems to me worthwhile. But I have to say I'm rather skeptical about it, in part because uh, the difficulty of, of um, enforcing uh, such, a, such agreements or even uh, confirming that one side or the other is foregoing certain capabilities, even harder when the capabilities don't have a physical manifestation. So I would think probably what's going to happen is that if there is going to be uh, stability in that competition, it will emerge out of the uncertainty that 
all parties have about the effectiveness of cyber weapons and also about the belief that regardless of what happens in the initial phases of a cyber conflict, uh, there will be the potential for a second strike. Uh, but those are just speculations. Um, this wasn't directed at me, but the question about transparency being a good thing, um, I like this question. I like it so much that I actually asked it of my graduate students on their general exams this year. Uh, as I was thinking about it, and some of the answers were okay. Uh, not all of them. Um, it seems to me that uh, two things. One, uh, it depends, I suppose, on what's being revealed by the transparency, what's on the other side. But overall, transparency seems desirable from the perspective of a stronger status quo power which has stated objectives to maintain the status quo and has superior capabilities and much less appealing uh, to a state that is, perceives itself as being weaker and perhaps does have intentions to alter the status quo. It's going to be very reluctant to fully reveal those. Uh, the United States has taken this position that China should be more transparent and forthcoming. Uh, and again, I said I'm not a diplomat, so I'll, I'll say this. Uh, this is really a win-win uh, proposition for the United States. Uh, either China is not sufficiently transparent, in which case it appears to be secretive and perhaps malevolent, or it reveals the full extent of its uh, capabilities and perhaps its ambitions and frightens everyone. Uh, so China has issued a white paper about its uh, strategy uh, just in the last week. Uh, and arguably, I think this uh, declaration of intent to develop further power projection capabilities is going to cause anxiety. Uh, they're perhaps being more forthcoming and more open, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's reassuring to everyone. Uh, the question was asked about the role of, of third parties uh, and their contribution to stability or the lack of stability uh, in Asia. I think it probably depends uh, on a variety of considerations. Uh, and let me just use Japan as an example, not to single out Japan particularly. But uh, if Japan were proceeding to pursue uh, its uh, a military policy that was independent of that of the United States in an attempt to balance against China to some degree, and if, for example, it sought nuclear weapons, that would be deeply destabilizing. On the other hand, a Japan that's closely aligned with the United States and is increasing its military capabilities can contribute to an overall balance in the region. It seems to me that's not what China might like, but I think the end result could be stabilizing. Um, on the question of the use of law enforcement uh, as compared to explicitly military capabilities, um, on the one hand, I think you could argue that the uh, existence of these capabilities does present options to countries that want to avoid taking a next step in which gray-hulled ships, so-called, would uh, collide with one another. Uh, so perhaps having that option is a desirable thing and could uh, prevent escalation of confrontation. On the other hand, if there's a deliberate blurring of what is a military and what is a non-military vessel, if you have ostensibly non-military vessels that are very heavily armed, for example, uh, the difference perhaps doesn't mean so much. Okay, I, I'm, I'm sorry we have uh, lost, uh, there may not be an arms race, but we have lost one race, and that's the race against time. Uh, it was 6.30, and I think we won't have time even to just go around asking for more questions, and I do recognize that there are a couple of uh, individuals who wanted to speak, but we really do have to uh, uh, end this uh, very stimulating discussion, and I think we could have gone on, and oh. maybe at uh, dinner, if you can call us some of the protagonists, we can continue this discussion, but let me thank, uh, uh, on behalf of all the uh, uh, people present here, our five distinguished panelists for uh, sharing uh, with us their, their views. Thank you very much. Thank you.